I'd like to start um, by uh, sort of changing the way we think about things. I'd like you to imagine three parallel universes. And let's imagine that these parallel universes were identical until, say, about 1980, um, at which point they started to diverge. Um, and now let's briefly explore each of those uh, universes. Now, so in the first one, as technology started to become ubiquitous, the idea struck a small group of people that one day the whole world's knowledge might be available at their fingertips. So just a, a finger press or swipe, um, everyone would be able to access all the information in the world um, from a device you might carry around in your pocket. But in this universe, try as they might, they simply could not increase the storage capacity of their portable devices. Um, and the whole world's data was measured in exabytes, but the maximum they could squeeze out of the storage on their handheld devices by the early 2020s was maybe a few terabytes. And this was a problem, um, because the dream was to carry around all the world's data. Blink of an eye, you can touch, swipe, and, and access it, and they can never achieve this dream. And so what happened instead, a small army of people tried to solve this problem by spending their days aggregating all the world's information, all the world's news stories, into what they called the golden source of truth. And then every night what they did is they distributed this information to everyone's handheld devices, which was about the best kind of workaround that they could, they could, they could find. So meanwhile, in parallel universe number two, um, they solved this problem. So rather than building central repositories of data, um, where newspaper, newspapers, articles, and photographs could be stored, um, they realized what was needed was a highly distributed system. And so rather than handheld devices storing all the information, um, those handheld devices could access the information held on servers potentially the other side of the world. And no one person or organization controlled the, data, the, the creation, storage, or distribution of data. So I think we're familiar with that parallel universe. And so what the, what the other universe could only dream about was made, was made real, and that's the, the whole world's information could be accessible in your, in your pocket, uh, in a device. Um, people in universe number two, they had a different problem. So while they essentially reformulated, they remade their publishing industry um, via uh, the web into a fully distributed system, the prevailing viewpoint on data management in the, in the enterprise was to centralize. And so they started with a sort of first the era of data warehousing, where all the likely questions that might be asked of the data were identified in advance. And then data was stored in marts, which were correlated with the kind of categories of these, of these questions. And then that didn't work, so they came up with the idea of data lakes, where the structure of data was more fluid. Um, but they still had a problem, which was essentially how to ask questions of the data and get, get answers back instantly. So work around upon work around, try as they might, they simply could not solve this problem. Whereas, back in universe number one, they had realized that some time back, the problem was how data was architected. So rather than centralizing repositories, they needed an architecture to let data live where it was happiest. And data is happiest where it's close to those who create and use it. And data and logic, and the logic by which it's processed, are, are need to be separated into different levels of abstraction. And so the breakthrough came when they realized that they were thinking about data in the wrong way. So it was a long-held, although very seldom articulated, uh, notion that computers will always give you the right answer to any question given sufficient time, computational resources, and data. Give, uh, assuming of, uh, uh, you, you, you ask the question in the right way, of course. So put simply, um, accuracy is treated as a constant. And the volume of data, the time of latency of response, that's the variable. More data, it will take longer to compute the answer, but you can offset this by throwing more computational resource at the problem. Feed more data in, and you'll be back to square one again. So people in universe one, they realized that while accuracy was sometimes necessary, and maybe even imperative, a large number of cases, it wasn't actually what people wanted from computers. And you can imagine when cycling through photographs on the kind of parallel universe Facebook, um, people didn't need to wait for every single photograph to download before they found the right one. They just skimmed through pixelated views of different photographs until the one that they wanted came into view, and then they waited for that to download in its 
full high resolution glory. And the same was true of navigating maps. So you didn't need to have a high level of detail of every single road on every single street of, of the world. You simply could make out the rough contours of the features that you recognized in the pixelated view and then wait for the next level of detail to download. But to do this for business data requires a, a rethink to how you architect solutions. And that's the thing that people in Universe One achieved. And so by treating data in the same way as, treat, as, as microservices, you can build highly composite data lakes, virtual data lakes, which enable you to develop systems that can query all of your data all of the time. And so for example, if you asked us the question, what were your sales in Sirencester yesterday? you would get a resource which would instantly return its, its results um, based on when it was last computed. And calling that resource would also trigger it to check whether any of its dependencies have been updated. And if so, it was set about recalculating so that it would be ready to give the, the, the true answer next time it was polled. And so what would this mean for the people in Universe One? Well, firstly, the interface between humans and machines becomes a lot more natural. By making latency of response a constant, let's say maybe half a second, accuracy can be improved by reducing the data volume or by increasing computational resources. And that's a big difference between what we do today. We, we increase our latency by throwing more computational resources at the problem, um, but accuracy is always the content. We just wait for the right answer to come. So people would simply ask a question and get an answer. And if they need the right answer, they would simply wait for the result to dissolve into view, much as like a pixelated image on Facebook comes into view uh, if you wait for it long enough. And this architecture would be resilient, a little bit like the web over in universe number two. Data engineers wouldn't need to worry about managing the complexity of the system. So when you, when you manage your website, I can, I can change my website if, if um, Tony lets me, because uh, he, he's uh, always a bit nervous letting me anywhere near the code. Um, but you can change your website confident that you're not going to bring down BBC News or, or something else. So the system has a high amount of, um, of, uh, of resilience. And if a field changes, then the lineage of where else the data um, is mapped or related without, through, the, through, the, through, the, um, through the system can easily be exposed. And by simply by changing the definition of the data, other nodes would recompute and allow for the modification. So you've got more resilience, more performance, and more reliability. And I don't believe that we need to stay stuck in Universe 2. I believe that we can make the switch to Universe 3, which is literally the best of both worlds. And the web has taught us the power of distributed systems. Um, we've built, essentially, a, a distributed publishing engine. That, that is the web today. But if we think about the same principles for computation, which is data processing, uh, we could achieve a very similar a similar result. So of course, Universal, Universe One doesn't exist, um, no surprise there, um, but the technology I, I described does, and it's called NetKernel, and it was built here in Bristol. Um, and I've recently joined the company as CEO, and I'm thrilled that we can start the process of building yet another great tech company um, here in this great city. So if you'd like to hear more about this product, um, then speak to me or our CTO, Tony, um, if it, any technical questions, better fielded towards Tony. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll be delighted to, to talk to you more about it. But um, I haven't been here to, to give a sales pitch. Um, I've been here to talk about what it means to be a data philosopher. So I'm going to stick to that theme. And the idea about being a data philosopher came to me a few years ago. I used to run a small data analytics company um, in London. And um, what's interesting, I think, from my perspective, is I'm a classicist by background. Um, but I have spent my career in technology. And I've always found it quite frustrating how technology marketeers, they kind of rather liberally mislabel um, technology to create the impression of something where the underlying technology is, is actually something uh, very different. And a good example of this, or a current example of this, is the idea of smart contracts in the context of blockchain. Um, so smart contracts, they are neither smart nor any more contractual than any other bit of computer code. Although the term somehow implies that they have magical legal status and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the smart bit implies there's some intelligence behind it, but essentially they're just following, following rules, they're just executing on the rules that are being programmed in. 
Um, and even the blockchain itself, the industry, the blockchain industry kind of hides behind sort of this mis mislabeling of technology. So a more general term for blockchains is distributed ledger technology. What they aren't really a distributed system. Um, it'd be much more accurate to call it a replicated ledger technology. And the reason that you architect blocks of data chained together is because this is a really efficient way of replicating data between nodes um, and also dealing with, um, dealing with change. But it's a really, really inefficient way of querying or storing or analyzing data, which is the purpose behind 99.9% .9 of database technologies. Um, but this, these facts are hidden when we call them a distributed ledger technology. Most business users just assume it's just another database, which it's not. I was drawn to these problems when I first, um, when I first came across much earlier in my career about data warehousing. So to me, when I thought about a warehouse, it's a distribution facility. And a distribution facility can accept packaged goods in any form, any shape, and any size. But when you build a data warehouse, you need to think, you are required to think about the shape and size of the types of queries that your end users would have. So a much better analogy would be to think of your data warehouse as being the sort of warehouse that can only deal with tinned goods. Um, but if anything comes in in a jar, you're going to have to rebuild it or, or build another facility. And today we talk about data lakes. But lakes are natural phenomena, so the best we could ever really engineer would be a data reservoir. But the rhetoric behind data lakes is to conjure up this idea that you could swim around the data free and unconstrained. But the reality is that most administrators of such systems try to put signs up saying no swimming um, around the shoreline because they, just, they don't want you to pollute the data. They don't want their data lake to turn into a data swamp. And the same is true of the cloud. You know, when, I, when I think of like utopia, I think of this beautiful day, blue sky, sunshine. Um, but the tech industry markets this idea of, 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 of you know, cloud. When I think of clouds, I think overcast day, miserable, gray, like it so often is. Um, but when you see the, the marketing, you always have this, these beautiful fluffy things in, in the sky. Um, so again, marketeers are kind of getting, getting ahead of themselves. And so when I, when I started um, coming across and talking about data science um, back around 2010, I noticed that, again, the marketeers were getting ahead of themselves. And for me, and, I, and please forgive me, as I know I'm speaking to a data science audience here, um, but data scientists are really statisticians with some hacker skills. Um, and yet, by, by relabeling data science, um, you know, the Harvard Business Review says it's the sexiest job in the, in the 21st century, just a few years ago. Um, and I think this is a very interesting phenomenon. You might say, who cares? You know, so what? These are just labels. Um, well, to me, actually, you know, a name actually does, does matter. And there was a 20th century philosopher called Wittgenstein, and he said, um, quite famously, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. And what he meant by this is when we, when we play, we all play language games, but only when we speak a common language can we really be describing the same thing. An example of this would be um, the word influence in English. Um, which means have, having the capacity to change or affect something. But if you translate, its translation in German is Einfluss, um, and this means to flow together as one. The terms are synonymous, but actually the way you think about their meaning is very different. So the limits of our language truly is, or are, the limits of our world. And those of you who are coders, um, you'll probably understand this more clearly than most. The limits of your languages are clearly and truly the limits of the worlds that you build. Now, if this was a sales presentation, I might say that one of the most powerful aspects to, to our product NetKernel is that we can share scope across multiple programming languages and across multiple Turing machines. And think of that as almost like a universal grammar coupled with a universal vocabulary. But um, this isn't a sales presentation, so I must stick to talking about data philosophy. Um, so it was only when I was working in the field of data analytics and data science that I start, it started dawning me how many times we were faced with ethical challenges in our work and also how ill-equipped most of my colleagues were um, to deal with them. And I'll give you an example. It was a well-known uh, British uh, brand, which I won't mention their name, um, but they invited us to pitch to help them build a, a new core banking platform um, that would be central to their new digital-only bank. And so we were asking them you know, what they were hoping to achieve from um, data analytics uh, capability. 
And the response was quite horrifying. Um, they said, you know, that for them, the value of the transaction data running through the platform was incredible. And if they could only incentivize people to get onto the platform, um, they could monetize that data very successfully. Um, you know, and I think that, that for me was a, a big kind of red light going off and, and you know, clearly something which I felt um, you know, we, uh, you know, we shouldn't be doing. And I think our clients hadn't thought about this um, and they hadn't appreciated the ethical challenge until we pointed it out. And time and time again I see this playing out in data science. And mostly it's down to the individual producer, the, the data scientists on the ground, to decide how to solve these problems as they arise. And the problem is kind of obvious, really, when you look at it. And yet so few people, I think, have developed a, a strategy to solve this problem. So my question is, how many of you are from a liberal arts background? <laughs> One. <laughs> Two, good me. Brilliant. Um, but the thing is, well, the way we teach our science is so, um, is, is so, is so separated from the way that we teach classics. So science and philosophy only kind of really tend to meet in areas of regulation or standards or, or law. Um, but regulation and law are very different um, from ethics. And I realize there's a big gap um, in the industry that if we are to really usher in this brave new world powered by data analytics, we're going to need more, a much more interdisciplinary approach to Solving this and simply getting data visualizers um, teamed up with machine learning programmers, we need data philosophers too. And so for me, being a classicist in the tech industry, I've always been a bit of an outsider to both groups. My uh, friends, when I was studying law, they've all gone into becoming lawyers or management consultants. And for them, using technology is just uh, not something about changing the world, it's about sending an email. And yet to the techies that I work with, uh, my lack of computer science background um, is, a, is an issue. And so I experienced this, this problem quite recently um, here in Bristol when I, I gave a TED talk at TEDx Bristol in uh, November. And um, the, real, the, kind of the thrust of this was I was fed up with the media presenting um, a, a kind of what I see as a very ill thought out argument about robots stealing our jobs. And even the um, even the response to this is even worse, it's, it's much less thought out. Um, and you know, largely it goes along the lines of it will be a problem for some people, but we'll, we'll reskill and retrain re people just in time. And to me, it misses the fundamental point about automation that um, none of us really would bother getting jobs if we didn't need to. And the same technology that might take away jobs has the power to provide the needs that we have in such a way that we might not need to go out and get jobs in order to survive in the future. And so my message for my TED talk was really one of hope um, about technology. And also one where I was trying to subtly say that if we think about things differently, um, then we might get the outcome um, that we're looking for much easier. So, um, so that, that was my, my TED. Um, and I was, very, I was kind of shocked by, by one person who, who uh, responded. And many of you will know him, Stephen Few. Um, he's... Uh, He's one of the greatest data visualization experts, uh, and I've been a big fan of, of Stephen's work. Um, in fact, his book, Information Dashboard Design, uh, we made core reading um, to every single one of our, our team in my old data analytics company. And so you can imagine I was pretty horrified when I read um, Stephen's blog at the end of December, which basically um, trolled me and, and, and slated my TED, uh, TED talk. Um, and also invited a rather personal attack um, on me uh, from his followers. You'll have to like, watch my TED talk and you'll have to read Stephen's blog article to see really what the fuss was about. But it dawned on me that this was the same example, um, another example of the same problem. Because you see in Stephen's work, he's very familiar with the kind of ethical challenges that we face as, as data analytics practitioners as also as, as the, the ethical challenges we face as an industry as a whole. And because of this, he speaks out on issues of digital ethics, and I think this is a good thing. Um, I think we need to encourage a duplicity of the different perspectives on the subject and also promote more conversations about the impacts of our work on the world. But where Stephen and I differ is essentially that I see the value in his contribution to digital, digital ethics despite his lack of background in, in classics, whereas he sees my contribution 
uh, to digital ethics has been valueless because I lack a technology background. And because Stephen and I don't have the same background in philosophy, um, that those, um, so, yeah, because Stephen doesn't have the same background in philosophy that those with a liberal arts background has, he wasn't really able to join the same language game and so resorted to an ad hominem attack. And those of us with a classics background know that if all else fails, um, go for an attack on the personality on the other side of the debate. And if you can do that with enough charisma and you can do that with enough of a following, you might just overcome even overwhelming evidence against your point of view. And I think the recent US presidential election is a great example of, of that approach playing out. I was recently drawn to a book, um, it was called Life 3.0 by astrophysicist Max Tegmark. And I'm a big admirer of his work, um, particularly because he's the guy that um, was responsible for founding the Future of Life Institute. And this aims to ensure that the technology we're building um, is, is aimed towards making a better future for, for mankind. And this is a clearly noble aim and one which I think is very necessary if we are going to survive um, as a species the impact of the technology we're building. And in his book Life 3.0, which I recommend reading, uh, everyone reading, he explores the potential for uh, technology to play um, and how it, how it might play out. It's kind of part science fiction, it's part philosophy and it's part astrophysics. But the problem I have with this is while his intention is very good, um, his message would have been significantly strengthened um, had it been reviewed um, by um, a classicist. Just as if I had written a book on astrophysics, I would have definitely got the maths checked by somebody um, who, who had, a, had a tech background. So he writes um, about the founding of the Institute and he explains the, kind of the, the rationale behind it and how they attracted some of the greatest names from the AI industry, people like um, Murray Shanrahan, um, Margaret Bowden, um, Stuart Russell and, and about 100 others. But what was missing from this group of 100 people are the classicists, the philosophers, the artists and the linguists. Surely these people also have something to say about the future of life. Or is their view just not important because they're not from a technical background? I had a, an opportunity a few years ago, a wonderful opportunity, to spend an afternoon with um, Brent Spiner, who many of you will know um, as the actor who played Lieutenant Commander Data in um, Star Trek The Next Generation. And um, he asked me why I, asked, I invited him to come and speak at our big data conference. And <laughs> to me, it, it, it was obvious. But uh, um, he, uh, he said that he sees Star Trek as the gift that keeps giving. Um, and um, I, I truly believe that he remains mystified as to the impact that his character has had on the whole generation of technologists growing up and even non-technologists growing up. Um, and I said to him that for me, what I was curious about was that you know, there are those of us who aim to build machines to play human. What might we learn from a man who played a machine? And he laughs and he says, uh, he said, look, I can barely use an iPhone. Um, I'm, I'm an actor. I, I've just got nothing to contribute to the technology industry. Um, but to me, he was very wrong um, because as an artist, he has a huge amount uh, to contribute to the technology industry. And he already has and, and maybe hasn't realized that. And here in Bristol, our own um, David McGowan, um, he makes the same point. It's an interdisciplinary approach, taking technology, te technologists and artists, bringing them together. Um, and when you bring them together, that's when uh, we can really make some progress. So I'll end on a final point. Um, I was speaking uh, with a CTO of a, of a bank a few weeks ago, um, and uh, he said that to him, um, technology is the easy part. Um, the problem is people. Getting them to change has been the hardest part of his job. And I thought this was a really, really interesting uh, point of view, but one which I totally disagreed with. Um, to me, technology, good technology, um, fits your hand like a glove. It's so natural, it does not require any change. And it's easy to say that people are the problem when you try and impose bad technology on them. But when the technology is well thought out and well designed around their needs, then no change is necessary. So I asked him, just look at when you rolled out iPads across your organization, how much was your training budget? And that's the best thing about being a data philosopher, because philosophers have, have the luxury of just asking the questions. The answers come from everyone else. Thank you.